Welcome to the conversation. Our guest today is Joseph Paris, uh, the author of State of Readiness, uh, discussing operational excellence. Thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Brian. Yes. So, um, what inspired you to write this book? And just in a broad sense, um, you know, what is operational excellence and how has your life journey led you to this book right here? Uh, you know, there's more perspiration than inspiration, you know, yeah. once I started writing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've been in the field of continuous improvement, my whole goal has been to uh, help companies improve their performance. We're all about computer systems. You know, increasing the performance of a company was best had by information technology. At the time, now I'm, you know, I'm gray haired. <laughs> so at the time, we were PCs, and network PCs were in their infancy. Wi Fi didn't exist. You know, cell phones, you know, were bricks that you saw maybe on Wall Street, yeah, you know, yeah. Wall Street. Um, and eventually that led to networked applications, ERP systems. And, you know, now we're really starting to help companies improve their performance. But you reach a plateau. Mm -hmm. And in my case, it came in about 2005, where I saw that the people were servicing the technology more than the technology was servicing the people. Mm -hmm. So I said they had, there had to be a better way. Mm -hmm. And I started exploring people skills and things like uh, uh, industrial engineering, systems engineering. You know, how do we optimize people in the processes? How do we relegate technology to where it's useful, not where it's overkill, not where it's getting in the way? Uh, and then there's this buzzword that came up, operational excellence. And, and you know, what does that all mean? Because when I was looking at people in their processes, I saw that they were very linearly focused. They weren't focused on the organization. They weren't focused on systems. They were just saying, how do I compress the amount of time and effort it takes to you know, create an outcome? So uh, I knew that operational excellence had to involve systems. It had to start cutting across the... The, the functional smokestacks of the organization. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I did after an industrial engineering conference, LinkedIn was still in its infancy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was on it, and I uh, grabbed the group name Operational Excellence because it was available, and I said, mm -hmm. you know, let's explore this thing. Yeah. And I really didn't pay too much attention to it until I got 5,000 users. Mm -hmm. And then LinkedIn says, hey, you have to ask for, for permission because it's over 5,000 users. And like, 5,000 users, it's a lot of users, you know, members of this group. Um, so I, you know, requested the permission, and they approved it. Yeah. And then I got another note at 10,000. Mm. And it's like, 10,000 people? <laughs> Who the heck are these 10,000 people? Yeah. Now I started paying attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I was paying attention before because I'd have to moderate it and I'd have to approve people, but I wasn't really yeah. engaged in the group. I was just, lack of a better term, just growing membership. Yeah, yeah. But what I discovered in the conversations when I really started paying attention mm -hmm. was that the problems and the challenges and the opportunities that companies face mm -hmm. and the people face around the world are the same. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter, spin the globe, put your finger wherever it stops, as long as it's not in the ocean someplace, <laughs> and people have the same challenges everywhere. Mm -hmm. What is very different is the way they approach the challenges. You know, um, the people in South Africa, for instance, very industrious people. Things break down all the time. They don't necessarily have the supply chains in place mm -hmm. in order to get the parts necessary yeah. uh, in a timely basis. So they're all about duct tape and WD-40. You know, I mean, whatever, whatever yeah. it's going to take, you know, chicken wire, whatever it's going to take to fix this thing yeah, right yeah. now yeah. is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. um, other uh, countries uh, that don't have those challenges uh, look at the opportunity and resolve the opportunity in a different way. The Germans, very meticulous. Mm -hmm. You know, they will engineer the death out of it before they, they implement. Uh, Americans are a little bit more, um, uh, well, they don't think everything through all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's okay because if they make a mistake, yeah. they just fix it. You know, uh, a German, if he makes a mistake, he's not going to admit it. Mm. You know, it's just like they don't make mistakes. That's all. <laughs> and if they do, they're not going to yeah, yeah. admit it. I mean, just think about the, the Volkswagen debacle, for mm. instance. Oh, yes. Okay. You know somebody there had to approve it. Somebody had to design it. Somebody had to actually yeah. make it and, and say this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows who that somebody is. Oh, wow. Somebody had to do it. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows who it is. So, you know, these are the things that, you know, I, I, I started exploring, developing my ideas of operational excellence. Mm -hmm. um, 
another uh, aspect was I met a gentleman by the name of uh, Matt Boom Daniel. Mm -hmm. uh, Boom, it's his, his call sign, mm -hmm. he's a uh, marine aviator. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started talking about how an aircraft carrier works. And I said, you know, he looks like a guy from Top Gun. You know what I mean? He's yeah. like cut and everything else. I mean, he's like, uh, he looks like he should have been on the movie set of Top Gun. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, geez, guy, you know, how do you look so good? I mean, how do you guys, you know, do, he says, listen, we are the natural outcome of everybody else on that ship doing their job. Okay? We look good because they make us look good. You know, and I was like, wow, that's really, I mean, that's really a significant statement. You know, here you are, you have the opportunity, you know, he's a, he's a fighter pilot, and, you know, here he is saying that, you know, he's only as good as everybody else helps him to be. And so that really started getting me thinking about what is operational excellence, you know, what are all the different dimensions in an organization that, uh, you know, make it a high performance organization rather than a routine organization? Yeah. How do you make a company work better, work faster, decide quicker, mm -hmm. undecide quicker if it's a wrong decision or if they need to modify the decision? Mm -hmm. uh, so these are all the things that you know, yeah. came up to my idea of what operational excellence is. But then there's another dimension. Uh, and that had to do with the people. Because, you know, uh, some of these form, uh, ideas were formulated during the, the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, during the Great Recession, I never knew how many poor rich people I knew. Mm. Okay, uh, they were leveraged just like everybody else. You know, they didn't own the cars, they didn't own the houses, they had loans on everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking at these people, and I'm looking at the challenges, and, and the companies wanted more output from their, their people. Mm -hmm. And you can't sustainably ask more of your people indefinitely without them crumbling. Mm. So it's not just about increasing the performance of companies, mm -hmm. but also the circumstances of the people that work there. And that's really, really important. I think that companies are going to uh, be faced with a challenge right now mm -hmm. as the unemployment's down to, what, 4.4% or yeah. something like that, mm -hmm. you know, where their expectations of their people uh, that unsustainability is going to be realized. Mm -hmm. People are going to say, you know what, I want to work less, mm -hmm. you know, less intensely than I did before, mm -hmm. okay, during the crisis. Mm -hmm. I want more pay, yeah. okay, and, you know, the companies are going to be slow to react. So what, they're going to, what you're going to see is you're going to see people mm -hmm. um, not becoming unemployed, but, but becoming differently employed, mm -hmm. working someplace else because the company didn't, didn't yeah. you know, became complacent in their, their current circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are the things that are, are, are coming to play. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And sort of reading the book, um, you get, you know, I got a sense that this is not just a process, but it's really about understanding the soul of a company. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned before, um, your book really goes into the genesis of, you know, it touches on Japan. It touches on mm -hmm. the companies we've come to recognize today and how they got to now. Right. And um, what's fascinating is, you know, being uh, a college graduate in about a week or so, um, I, I, yeah, thank you. I grew up, you know, and the many companies we want to work for is the Googles, the Apples, mm -hmm. and it's, it's because of the sort of the, the culture and the way they approached human capital, you know, to your point in a sense of maximizing people and really uh, how, how does really understanding operational excellence, you know, get us a glimpse on how, how did businesses change? from the 90s, the cubicles, because, mm -hmm. you know, if you watch movies, Office Space, and you see these cubicles, yeah. and then now companies that recruit here from Binghamton or all over the place, they want to be hip, they want to be fun, they want to have a culture that people uh, feel that they're open, as well as touching on certain issues of gender equality, of how do you maximize all your employees uh, despite, you know, uh, the politics of the world and societal norms. Right, right. Such, yeah. right. But, you know, um, you read a lot about, uh, especially techno uh, technology companies, where there's a, um, uh, where, say, females are underrepresented, mm -hmm. okay? Now, I was just in uh, a board meeting of the engineering department here at the Watson School, mm -hmm. and they're telling me that, uh, they're demonstrating that only 25% of their students are females. Mm -hmm. So if you're only graduating 25% student, you know, female student uh, engineers, mm -hmm. then just stands to reason that you're only going to have 25% working in the companies. 
you know, just you, you know, there's going to be some massaging the statistics and whatnot. But you know, yeah. it's it's going to be more more or less than that. You're not going to expect 50 percent if you're only graduating 25 percent. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that gender equality has to start a lot earlier. Yeah. You know, when you're in high school, when you're in, you know, when you're growing up, um, that's the genesis of it. It's got to start earlier. If you want an outcome, you have to start the inputs sooner. Going to the corporate culture, though, yeah. companies become institutionalized over time if they're successful. You know, when I was growing up, Microsoft was the innovation company. 1981 or whatever it is, 82. I mean, Microsoft, that was the yeah. innovation company. And then, you know, of course, Apple was an innovation company at the time. Uh, but over time, mm -hmm. as it's, and it's easy to be an innovation company when you're small. You know, marketing is that, in that corner of the garage, and, and, and sales is in this corner of the garage, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, production, supply chains that, and finance, you know, we're all, if I need something from marketing, I just turn my chair around and I say, hey, I need something from marketing. Mm -hmm. When you become big and global, that intimacy doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And in its place, we have to put in controls, or we feel that we do. Um, Google, they, when they first went uh, did their IPO, they made a big deal about 20% time. You know, if you work for Google, you can spend 20% of your time at Google thinking about whatever it is that you want. They did away with that a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Now nobody gets 20% time unless they specifically request it, and then they have to tell them what it's for. And you know, it, yeah. the whole spirit of 20% time is gone. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, and the reason being is because that person reported to a manager, and that manager was measured on that manager's out, outputs. Mm -hmm. And he's assuming that the people that are working for him have 100% devotion to his outputs, his expected outputs. Ah. Now, all of a sudden, no, he's only getting 80%. Mm -hmm. He's only getting budget for the 100%, but, you know, yeah. you, you can't then hive off 20% of that you know, yeah. uh, to let them dream whatever it is that they want. So yeah. these, these are the challenges, you know, when, you're, when a company's young mm -hmm. and uh, lean mm -hmm. and singularly focused, yeah. it's, it's easy to be innovative, it's easy to be disruptive. Mm -hmm. When you're bigger, mm -hmm. less so. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of interviews where, you know, a lot of these CEOs say that, you know, especially at Microsoft, where they miss the whole smartphone, you know, uh, and the arrow cloud. and the cloud, and you see companies like Facebook combating that conglomerate, you know, giantness by buying smaller companies like an Instagram, you know, like a uh, WhatsApp, mm -hmm. and they buy subsidiaries who do maintain that leanness. Um, but then you also hear on the other end where you look at a Uber, where they were disruptive, you know, to the taxi industry. But you mm -hmm. see how, again, to your point they were in a state of readiness because you hear what's going on in the sense of just from the CEO to top down right. where um, they didn't meet, you know, expectations. Right. Well, there's a couple of things that you talked about there. You know, first off, Facebook, some of their acquisitions were not strategic mm -hmm. except that they're preemptive. You know, they bought Instagram so Google didn't get it. <laughs> no, seriously. Oh, I mean, yeah. and, they had, and they had their messenger already, mm -hmm. okay, and they bought WhatsApp, you know, for all of their users, okay, and of course WhatsApp had some, some technology too, but they're having a hard time monetizing that, you know, but again, you know, some of these purchases were not for the, the technology, I mean, I was posting pictures on Facebook long before Instagram came along, mm, yeah. you know, so, you know, some of these purchases that they do are oftentimes just so somebody else doesn't get it. And there's a couple of challenges at Uber. I mean, first off, Uber grew very, very fast, very sprawled. They, they had conflicts with other cultures in other countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a lot of moving parts with Uber. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a difference between the drivers, of course, and the people running the company, developing the technology and, and trying to set the vision. Um, I've driven a lot of times with Uber. And I started actually in Mexico. Uh, Monterrey, Mexico is when I, you know, loaded up my first Uber app oh, because, wow. you know, the, the cars there were, you know, the regular taxis were not very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I started talking to the Uber drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a gentleman, uh, I was in Anaheim, California, I was taking a ride to LAX. He picked me up in a, a I don't want to call it a stretch mini, but it was one of those longer minis. It wasn't yeah. a mini mini, it was yeah. a long, bigger mini. <laughs> And, you know, I get in the back of his car, and um, he's got two water bottles there. And he says, you know, you know welcome to my car, you know, yeah. welcome to my Uber, and uh, I'll, you know, 
LAX and and uh, he's very kind, very nice guy. You know, we're talking. And of course, I'm you know, how's it driving for Uber? Yeah. And he loves it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know, I got I, I started doing the drill down because you know you know that's what I do. I try to figure <laughs> out how things yeah. how things work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what made him drive for Uber? Well, you know, he loved the freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, if he wants to spend some time with the family, mm -hmm. he just doesn't clock in. You know, and he spends time with the family. If he knows there's a big event and he can make some extra money, then he clocks in. And he does, you know, he doesn't have to compete with seniority mm -hmm. at, you know, like you might with a, a taxi company. Um, you know, and I, ultimately, I asked him the, the big question. Yeah. How much do you clear on a year, yearly basis? How much money do you actually, like, after all your expenses, mm -hmm. after everything else, how much do you clear? He's like, you know, $54,000. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what, that's... It's not an unreasonable living, mm -hmm. you know. And like I said, his car was was spotless. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I took another uh, taxi from Chicago to Stromberg, I think it is, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a twenty minute ride. Taxi at the airport. I mean, the whole thing was just beat beat yeah, up, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. and uh, rickety, and I you know, it was just smelly, and it was just dirty. It was just a disgusting thing, and all for sixty dollars. Oh. Mm -hmm. I took Uber on the way back. Mm -hmm. This uh, uh, a woman picks me up in a Nissan SUV. All right. Again, spotless. Again, you know, like outstanding service, uh, and it's twenty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, wow. yeah. if she was not happy with making that twenty-five dollars, mm -hmm. then she wouldn't do it. There's a disconnect there, though, between uh, what's happening on the street, mm -hmm. and I've never met a, an Uber driver that wasn't happy doing mm -hmm. their job. I'm sure there is, because there's always people that are unhappy with their job, but mm -hmm. I haven't met one. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a disconnect between that layer of employment or, or worker uh, and uh, the leadership of the company who obviously has a very aggressive, macho persona. You know what I mean? They're just like, they're up-and-comers. they got a lot of pressure on them. they got a lot of things. they got to be, you know, strong and quick. Um, and a lot of that, you know, goes away political correctness and empathy and everything else. And next thing you know, you're breeding a... Um, acidic culture, uh, you know, something that just yeah. is starting to eat from within. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think that's what you're seeing with them now. Now, that will fix itself, or it will be fixed for them. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. either, either the CEO will recognize that his corporate culture mm -hmm. is going to be just a, a, a cesspool of con contempt for mm -hmm. one another, uh, or he's going to um, uh, realize uh, that he's got to fix it, and, and he's got to realize that he's going to fix it, or the board is going to make that decision for him. Uh, so only yeah. time will tell that. Awesome. Now, um, you know, I have a two-part question, and, and it's really for, you know, especially not just for college graduates or mm -hmm. uh, people looking to find a new, you know, job. You know, especially you having such a rich history in the technology field um, in the 80s, uh, 90s, and you're seeing how, in terms of GDP, how technology companies have really, you know, tech, it's a whole buzzword, it's a, it's a whole bubble in a sense. Right, right. Um, being, wanting to start a job, let's say the traditional aspect of it, and then we'll go into the entrepreneur side, mm -hmm. uh, the traditional aspect of, in a sense of, how does one determine, you know, what you know, what employer should they, you know, should they go with? And, and I think when people ask themselves this, they look at salary, they look at, you know, location. But I think your book really uh, encourages people to look at the culture and to say that, you know what, um, you're a piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. and you have to make sure that, you know, the, the environment that you're, you're in allows for one uh, flexibility mm -hmm. and all these mechanisms lead to social mobility right. you know how you can have your trajectory and you mentioned in the beginning that you know growing up you wanted to be a, a pilot astronaut the typical things yeah. and uh, you reach a point in your life where you know you you sort of have to see your future and you and your expectations you know have have to meet realities right. so in the traditional sense having such a rich uh, experience in the in the in the job world. Um, what is your recommendations for somebody approaching the work uh, work field? And what you know key elements should they look for? Not just the traditional. Mm -hmm. What is my salary? Where right. do I live? Uh, is there good bars around? Yeah. You well, know? you know this is this is a um, this is a uh, very complicated and very personal question. Yeah. Okay. When I say personal, mm -hmm. um, you have to first. There's a saying: mm -hmm. if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so you have to keep that in mind. You know, if you love what you do, you'll never work a, a day in your life. Now, then you have to match your desired outcomes mm -hmm. with your desired inputs, okay, or the required inputs, okay? If you want to be the rich and famous, if you want to be the CEO guy, that person is going to be working 24-7. That's all that person does, okay? But what happens then is fall off. You know, other things are sacrificed. I mean, take Elon Musk, one of the most innovative, uh, most admired even by myself. I mean, I love the guy. I think he's one of the most innovative, dis you know, disruptive people on the face of the planet. Brilliant ideas uh, always coming out of this gentleman. And, uh, and he's able to put it in, you know, these things into action, you know. But he works so hard at what he does. And he's such a uh, working machine that his personal life suffers. Mm -hmm. You know, he's been divorced a couple of times. Um, you know, I'm sure it's not because he's a bad, nasty guy. You never see, you know, his picture on a, on a, a, a police lineup or anything like that or yeah. profile. Um, but that is, that's yeah. what fell off, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that, that's a choice he makes. And this is a choice that each of us have to make. Yeah. It's like, what's important to us? Mm -hmm. What do I enjoy doing? What kind of living can I make out of that? If I'm, you know, working a, a, a low-paying job that's very satisfying, the chances of me being able to afford all the fancy cars, vacations, and homes mm -hmm. are probably off the table. And as long as you're good with that, mm -hmm. then your choice is made. Very interesting. And, you know, to, to the second part of this question, um, you being uh, an entrepreneur, um, a lot of my friends, you know, uh, they know coding and they want to start the, the next Facebook and they want to mm -hmm. start an app. So. Um, you having experience with, of course, big companies, and, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you help smaller companies reach their goals. Um, what are one of the, you know, trends, the sacrifices that somebody who wants to be an entrepreneur has to recognize, and um, what are some of the challenges that they'll face, and what sort of things as an entrepreneur should you look for? Well, <clears throat> tenacity is one of the things that every entre entrepreneur uh, is going to, to need tenacity to just keep on pushing forward. Uh, funding is always going to be a gigantic headache in the beginning. Uh, and you're always going to need more than what you think. You're going to need more in money and you're going to need more in time. Those are the two things that uh, entrepreneurs underestimate all the time. Um, but that's okay because everybody does it. So, so it's yeah. the norm, so you know, yeah. we don't have to really worry about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the same time, if they wanted to ask for the real amount of money mm -hmm. and the real amount of time, yeah. they might lose investors, they might lose clients, they might lose a lot of things. So um, you know, I'm going to give you an anecdote. Mm -hmm. um, early on mm -hmm. in, in my business, it was probably late 1980s, um, <clears throat> we were representing an accounting system. Okay, that ran on PC networks. And uh, we had an opportunity to uh, pitch to an insurance company, a big insurance company in Philadelphia. We didn't have any money. And when I say we didn't have any money, we didn't have any money. You know, it's like, all right, uh, I was going down to Philly with, with a colleague, and we filled up his car with gas here in Binghamton. And then we drove down to Philly, and we're monitoring our cash. I mean, it's like, we're, you know, and okay, we have enough money for the tolls, all right, yeah. and and we have enough gas to get there and back. All right, so everything's good. Yeah. What we didn't count on was that we had to pay for parking in Philly. Ooh. Okay, and that's the problem. You know, this is like twenty bucks. Twenty bucks we didn't have. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the presentation is going great. It's going outstanding. I mean, everything is going happy, and, <laughs> and everybody's having a great time. And then uh, the the prospect says, "Let's go out to lunch." It's another thing we didn't plan on. And it's like, oh my God. And when I say we had no money, we didn't have any money. And we had, my credit cards were maxed out, and we had no money. Okay? Wow. So, um, fortunately, they volunteered quickly. Oh, we'll buy. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I was like, oh, good. Thank God. <laughs> so, we're at lunch. And after lunch, mm -hmm. uh, I give my colleague all of my credit cards with all my PIN numbers. Mm -hmm. I said, go to an ATM and try to find 20 bucks on one of these cards. Okay, I don't care which one it is, but you're just try to find 20 bucks, you know, yeah. so you get out of here. Um, and so he takes off, 
and uh, I go back to the meeting and where is your colleague? And I, I just said, he's checking in another colleague while, or client yeah. while we're down here. Yeah. You know, yeah. a white lie, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> the presentation goes great. They want a proposal. Mm -hmm. My colleague comes back. He found 25 bucks mm -hmm. in one of my accounts. Oh, so we were able to get my car out of hock and we're also able to get a cheeseburger and a bottle of water mm -hmm. uh, on the Northeast Extension, Pennsylvania Northeast Extension on the way, way back. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, man, that, that's yeah. nasty. No, the, the, the thing is, we won that job. Mm -hmm. We won this project. Mm -hmm. It was a big project. It was oh. very, very nice that we won this project. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this is, mm -hmm. this is the life of the entrepreneur, mm -hmm. okay? The tenacity, the having no gas in your tank, mm -hmm. the, the dry eaves in the morning because you're so anxious. I mean, this is, this is reality. So I don't wish that anybody or everybody be an entrepreneur because it really does yeah. uh, take a lot of intestinal fortitude. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really interesting story, and I definitely agree. Uh, you know, it does take you know it's a lot of sacrifices along the way that have mm -hmm. to be made. Um, now, in terms of the business economy we are in today, um, one of the key words that you know we always hear is globalization. Mm -hmm. And to me, you are a symbol of globalization. You live in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, you come down to Binghamton, uh, New York. Uh, you are a Watson uh, board member. And, uh, and again, your, um, your business, uh, Zantec Consultant Group, you must have clients all over the world. And um, you spoke about how different uh, countries that you've been to operate. So in a sense of globalization, what should people understand about it? There's a lot of fears about globalization and not in the sense of, um, you know, there's always going to be jobs obviously out there, but again, to your point in terms of Watts and in terms of students, um, you sort of, there has to be preparations beforehand. Um, right. So what are some of the preparations people should make for globalization? Well, if, if, if you're thinking about doing business overseas, the mm -hmm. first thing I would suggest, and I'm talking about in a meaningful way, I'm not talking about maybe yeah. outsourcing some writing uh, mm -hmm. to to you know, somebody in, in the UK or something like that, but I'm talking about some something that involves supply chains, mm -hmm. okay, or something that in, involves masses of people. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that you need to do is go there. Mm -hmm. So you really can't understand how uh, a people in a country work unless you go there what challenges they're going to face. Mm -hmm. We had a, a, a big project in Russia that went on for several years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the culture in Russia is one of punishment. Wow. Okay? Wow. If you work for a company, mm -hmm. the culture is punishment. If you make a mistake, you're going to get punished. Okay. Therefore, people don't want to make a decision. Because if they make the wrong decision, they're going to be punished. Be punished. All right? So what happens is that nobody makes a decision until it's a crisis then the crisis makes the decision for you. Nobody gets to blame and everybody gets to work the crisis. So what you have is a series, an ongoing series of crises, one after another. Mm -hmm. um, and that's no way to get ahead of the game. You're always behind. If you're always chasing the crisis, then yeah. you're never going to get ahead. Mm -hmm. um, which is really quite unfortunate because, you know, being in Russia several times, um, having worked there and what have you, uh, you know, <clears throat> they have Every, they have no reason not to be an economic global superpower just like the United States. They have smart people, mm -hmm. you know, they have n every natural resource they need. Mm -hmm. They don't have to import anything, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, except that their in inefficient, built-in inefficiencies mean that, means that they are, you know, in need of importing things. But, you know, if they had their act together, they could be an economic superpower. But their culture of, of punishment mm -hmm. prohibits that. Now, you, flip that over to the United States, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have, um, in the business world, we don't have a culture of punishment. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in uh, Silicon Valley, you're almost a nobody unless you've gone bankrupt at least once, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, there's a lesson there. If you've gone bankrupt once, you know what it looks like, mm -hmm. you know, coming down the pike. So the chance of you, you know, having, you know, gained that wisdom and doing the same thing again mm -hmm. is very, very small or considerably smaller. Yeah. You think about a company in Germany or in France, mm -hmm. if it goes bankrupt, if I own a company in Germany or France and it goes bankrupt, mm -hmm. it might take five to seven years to unwind that, oh, wow. okay? And in the interim, I, could, I might be prohibited mm -hmm. from owning a company ever again. Mm -hmm. Here, General Motors mm -hmm. 
goes in and out of bankruptcy. General Motors, in and out of bankruptcy in a month. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. There, it's not so much. Mm. Yeah, and, and in terms of, you know, processes, in your book you mentioned how, you know, and I, I didn't know this, uh, I'm also a history major, and um, how the Empire State Building took about, yeah. you know, 440, so, yeah, yeah. 40 odd days. Yeah. And, for uh, that's from the moment they put the first shovel in the ground yeah. to the time it was opened. It was 400 and something days. And, and in 1940s, with that technology... 1929. 1920, oh, wow. 1929. 1929. And so really, and then you contrast that with the building of the One World, um, you know... Uh, Freedom Tower. The Freedom Tower. And um, you sort of see the inefficiencies, you know, and uh, the bureaucracy of certain, you know, places and industries. Yeah. Um, working for um, your company, Zonatech, um, what's one of the the interesting stories or the interesting um, feedbacks that you've gotten um, and what's one of the advice that you can have for certain industries that you know want to improve their business? Well, uh, I don't want this to sound self-serving, mm -hmm. okay, but I'm, it's, I'm going to just lay it out there. People um, become numb to the opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, over time, that's the way it's always been. They don't know to look, they don't learn to look for the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, think about your daily commute, okay? And the audience's daily commute. You yeah, know? yeah. You think uh -huh. about your daily commute. You get in the car, you drive 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you're at your office. Mm -hmm. If I asked you to give me a detailed report of what happened on that trip, how many stoplights you, you, you uh, had to stop at, uh, was there anything unusual that might have come up, um, was the McDonald's sign on or off, I mean, whatever it might be, can you give me a detailed description of your trip? Hardly anybody would be able to do it because it's so routine that they just go through it. They don't. They don't live in it, mm -hmm. right? So, um, I think that uh, the a key and accelerant to an organization mm -hmm. going through a change or needing to go through a change is to get an outsider looking at the opportunity. Uh -huh. Okay, to be able to challenge it. You know, it's uh, you know the typical conversation might go something like that. You know, it's consultant comes in and says, you know, why do you do it that way? Well, we've always done it this way. And, well, why don't you do it this way? Because, you know, yeah. wouldn't that be better? Mm -hmm. And they look at us and like, wow, you're brilliant. Well, you know what? We're not particularly brilliant. We just don't know any better. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. Now, whether a company hires an outside consultant or takes somebody from another division mm -hmm. from within the company to look at it, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. But what you need is fresh eyes. Uh -huh. Yeah, you need to have somebody that is has the ability to question everything, you know, through, through the eyes of a child. For in terms of consultancy, what's one of the things you love, and you know, um, one of the interesting things you get to see? My brother works for Protivity, mm -hmm. and he always says that it's interesting how when you work for a certain company, let's say you, um, for example, when you're starting out. Uh, you, you got a bid for uh, an accounting firm and mm -hmm. you work with different industries um, and you get to see how they work and a lot of the times in the big four many people don't stay they right. work for two three years and then they get poached by right. the companies that they work right. for so what's one of the interesting things about consultancy and, and and it's very not a lot of people know the industry mm -hmm. of consulting well you know, most of the big companies mm -hmm. You know, and I don't want to scare any you know, <laughs> soon to be graduated MBA yeah. students, yeah. but most of the consultants, uh, big consultancies, they know that what they're getting are people that don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And so what they're going to do is they're going to grind, grind these people like nobody's business. You know, yeah. you know, data analysis, report writing, you know, 24-7 type of work. I mean, really, really grind uh, the heck out of them. Um, until some point in the future, uh, where they're able to elevate out of the entry level yeah. into you know front line, and when they ele uh, elevate into that front line, that's when they they get poached. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. nobody poaches the entry level person from from PwC or whomever. Yeah. So, <clears throat> when it comes to a consultancy, you know, we'll call it a boutique consultancy like me, mm -hmm. I can't afford to hire a bunch of people and try to figure out which ones are going to be, be the cream to the crop. Ah. Um, it just takes too much effort for me. Uh, and it just, you know, I couldn't afford it. I'm not, I'm not designed that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not, I'm certainly not patient enough to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our model mm -hmm. is to, uh, you know, get the people that are industry experts. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's in, in uh, insurance or finance or yeah. paper and pulp or oil and gas or automotive or aerospace. I mean, pick your industry, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I want to get people that have deep experience in those relative industries, mm -hmm. but also have spent the time consulting. Because consulting, mm -hmm. you have to be very empathetic. Mm -hmm. You have to have two ears and one mouth, mm -hmm. you know, so you listen twice as much as you talk. Mm -hmm. And not like in this interview, you know, <laughs> yeah. doing most of it. Okay. But um, these are the things, these are the skills that people in industry, without being consultants, mm -hmm. won't have. Oh. So you really have to, that, that, that you have to have mm -hmm. had experience as both yeah. a consultant mm -hmm. and deep industry vertical experience Interesting. and and that really um, touches on you know LinkedIn and uh, my brother always tells me uh, he sort of got out of the little the trench of you know being an entry level and you know you are you know what you're saying really resonates because once you reach a certain level uh, different companies start seeing you so with that there's sort of hope for students in a sense that you know to stick with something to say that um, you have to gain experience, um, like interning. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of the students who are sophomores, juniors, they have to intern and they complain about getting water bottles or yeah. getting coffee. Yeah. Um, but it's really about a process, and you learn so much in these years, and then you're able to sort of branch out. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're in entry level and you're getting that, you know, cup yeah. of coffee or that <laughs> water bottle, um, <clears throat> you have to remember it's not about the water bottle or the coffee. Mm -hmm. You should have. Your, your eyes and ears open at all times. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's things going around, on around you, mm -hmm. just like that drive, that commute to, to work, mm -hmm. okay? If you just go, you know, with tunnel vision to get that bottle of water and bring it back without looking around, mm -hmm. you know, without seeing what's on the whiteboard, mm -hmm. without listening to the conversations that are happening, mm -hmm. then you're gonna miss out on um, most of what an internship is mm -hmm. gonna give you. Um, you have to, you have to just make sure you don't get that tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. Now, um, lastly, um, you uh, you said you you're a mentor and you mentor students and other people. Um, as a mentor and um, for the coming uh, graduates, um, what's one of the last you know pieces of advice and and in, in a sense of being ready? You know, how can they be ready not only for just a, uh, for their future jobs, but just you know. The unexpectedness of, of life. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, Mike Tyson, you know, the famous boxer, yeah. he, he has a saying, or he was quoted as saying once, that everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. So you think about that, and you think about the state of readiness. Okay? You make yeah. this full circle. Yeah. It's not the fact that he's got punched in the mouth that makes his plan go away. Mm -hmm. He then relies on, you know, the capacity and capability of his training, mm -hmm. you know, his experience, to start going with the punches, so to speak, you know, so, you know, a student um, graduating, they might have some naive idea of what the future is going to hold them, and I only say naive because they haven't had the experience yet, right, and that's really what naive means, you don't, you don't have the experience yet, yeah. you have an opinion but no experience, mm -hmm. so, um, and that's, that's how everybody starts off, mm -hmm. and as you're going through um, uh, your, your professional career, yeah. what you have to do is you have to just assess, it. do I still enjoy it? Mm -hmm. Do I see where this is going? And I might not enjoy it now, yeah. but you know, I see my colleagues that might be a rung or two up the ladder yeah. beyond me. Do I enjoy what they're going, you know, mm -hmm. would I enjoy what they're doing right now? Mm -hmm. If the answer to that is no, get out. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, moved, I moved to Germany. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm a somewhat impetuous person. Mm -hmm. I'll give you two anecdotes. From the, from the day I met my wife, mm -hmm. from the day we knew each other existed on the planet Earth, mm -hmm. to the day we got married, it was eight weeks in a day. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and when I moved to Germany, everybody's like, no, you're moving to Germany. You know, what, do you, yeah. what if you don't like it? And if I don't like it, I move back. <laughs> you know, it's like life yeah. is full of do-overs. Yeah. I mean, life is really, really quite full of do-overs. Um, and if you don't like mm -hmm. your life's tra uh, trajectory, whether it's personal or professional, mm -hmm. You got to change it. Mm -hmm. you, know, if you, you might not like the moment. Mm -hmm. The moment doesn't matter. The moment will pass. Mm -hmm. But if you don't like the tra 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 uh, trajectory, yeah. if you don't like where it's going, mm -hmm. you got to you got to eject. Oh wow! Well, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. And, um, thank you, uh, and uh, see you next time.